Welcome to the Juniper Tree Podcast. The JTP is the first stage in healing ministry, supporting faith and healing through the Word. The Word of God is alive and active, and verse-by-verse study through the Bible can heal, help, and lead to a victorious life. Here's Pastor Michael with this week's study in the book of Esther. Thanks for tuning in again, and uh, great to hear, great to have you along with us. Uh, we are going to go inside the mind of Wiley Coyote for three parts. This is part one of Inside the Mind of a Wiley Coyote. The iconic Warner Brothers classic duo was the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. I believe as an artist. That Looney Tunes is some of the best drawn and well-written cartoons that have ever come out on the market. There is intelligence and the writing can touch children as well as adults. Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, and these two characters have been in my conversations with artists over many years of life. I spent four years of my life working with other artists in a store in New Jersey and we spent a great deal of our time talking about Looney Tunes. The premise of the Roadrunner cartoons is that, of course, Roadrunners are fast. The Roadrunner can run in excess of speeds of 20 miles per hour and they don't run in a straight line. The cartoon follows Wiley Coyote in his crazy schemes to capture and kill the Roadrunner. The funny part is, Wiley Coyote purchases items of capture from a store called Acme. Acme sells anything from rockets to spring loaded catapults, anvils, and such. It's very funny to watch him use these items, but they always blow up in his face. They also had some funny fictional products like do-it-yourself tornadoes, dehydrated boulders, earthquake pills. Why wait? Make your own earthquakes. Loads of fun. All the items usually ended Wiley Coyote and him falling over a cliff, exploding or being crushed. The Roadrunner would always escape the wiles of the Wiley Coyote. There are also people out there with the same mindset. They have the mindset just like Wile E. Coyote, they attempt to attack God's chosen people. But just like Wile E. Coyote will never catch a roadrunner, those people with the mind of a Wile E. Coyote will have all their worldly plans just blow up in their face. Now we get to the major point of this drama in Esther. It is a remarkable book and the best part is it's not a fictional book but a book of God's hand upon his people. Haman, vile Haman 666 is insane. He's raging. He's ticked off about one man named Mordecai, a Jew, So he decided to have a plan to annihilate him as well as all of his people. He gets an edict together and casts lots so that in another year the Jews would all be killed. Mordecai, fasting and mourning, tells Esther and she calls for a three-day fast. Says in verse 1, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in front of the inner court of the palace, in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When she saw Queen es- when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her, and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter three days of fasting, all the people fasting, 
And then she finally approaches, and she's accepted. She's safe here. And God's wisdom will be with her as she steps into this. The king had appointments set, and he had a busy schedule. If you were to interrupt the schedule of the king with an appointment of your own, you were put to death. He must know that Esther is serious when he knows she comes in hard circumstances. Then, in God's sovereignty, he places the scepter of safety for her to touch. Verse 3. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half of my kingdom, it will be given to you. Now, he's just saying this. If she really requested half, then she probably would have been put to death. He is saying he loves and values her. That's a whole different man than the one we saw with Vashti. He has changed. Not much, but slightly. And we can see the hand of God turning the heart of the king as the king turned his son's heart in Nehemiah. Esther, you have a blank check. Ask for anything. Verse 4 of chapter 5. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Now, this is important. God's name is hidden in this verse, in the acrostics, again. Remember in chapter 1, verse 20, all the women will respect. God's name is hidden in that verse. Esther 5, 4, let the king and Haman come today. We see it here. Esther 5, 13, but all this gives me no satisfaction. Esther 7, 5, the I am that I am, and Esther 7, 7, had already decided his fate. That's where we see God hidden in the acrostics of the verses. Esther asks, and God is directing the plan, as at this point the Jews are to be slaughtered. God is moving in the situation, and he is in control of it, not Haman. Verse 5, Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. So, Haman's ego is being stroked here. He's excited, since he's now being invited to have lunch with the king. He's becoming more confident, proud, just plain cocky. He is confident in all of his devious plans to annihilate Mordecai and the Jews, just like the roadrunner to a wily coyote. Haman feels his plan to get Mordecai is all falling into place. He's now having lunch with the royalty. He's excited and confident in himself about his wicked plans. That he's going to catch the roadrunner. And that he will succeed. Verse 6. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. Now, this is important. The grammar indicates that she is hesitant in answering. And God is moving in that decision. She is about to request... But something, or someone, God's Spirit, stops her. Maybe the Holy Spirit, New Xerxes, wasn't ready to hear it. There's some dynamic here that stops her. The Holy Spirit holds her from requesting 
which is pretty neat here. Now verse 8. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Now a lot's going to happen in these 24 hours. God will move in a mighty way through the next 24 hours here. It will be an interesting scene. As many events will take place that God knows. Have to before Esther does her request. In 24 hours, Haman's going to make a gallows to hang Mordecai on. Xerxes won't sleep the night before. Xerxes will make some interesting decisions. Wisdom from above and being prayerful about those decisions is something very wise to understand for the believer. There are times when decisions should be bathed in prayer and not decided right away. Verse 9 says, Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits, wily coyote. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai, which this guy is never happy. And I've seen many people over the years miss out with this Haman-type attitude. Vile Haman, 666. They have so much, and they're blessed with so many things by God, that they see one person or one problem and engulfs them to the point of unhappiness and anger. Haman has a family, he has wealth, he has power, but is mad over one man. Haman has one man steal his joy. He can't have any happiness unless Mordecai is destroyed. Mordecai is the roadrunner to Wiley Coyote, as Haman is the Wiley Coyote, and he will not be happy until he gets Mordecai. He is one of the wealthiest, powerful men in the world, ten sons and a family, yet his elevator won't reach the top floor because of one Jewish man. Wiley Coyote was always fixed with getting the Roadrunner. Mordecai, Haman is fixated about getting him. Verse 10. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, calling together his friends and Zeresh his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above all other nobles and officials. Haman brings over all his friends to get an ego boost. He boasted and bragged about himself to all his friends. He talked about all he had, all his great family, how he's better than all the other officials, how he, like Wiley Coyote, is a genius. Verse 12, and that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. Tomorrow, I am also invited to a party with the king because I am so great. Verse 13, here we go. We're going with another acrostic again. Ready? But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gate. So his boasting and bragging gets messed up again, and we see the third acrostic in this story. The third time God is hidden in the verse. Esther 1.20, all the women will respect. Esther 5.4, let the king and Haman come today. Esther 5.13, but all this gives me no satisfaction. Esther 7.5, the I am that I am. Esther 7.7, 7, 
he already decide his fate. Haman is not resting because God would not have him rest and be happy in his boasting. God is working in Haman and he won't rest until Mordecai is exterminated and all of his people with him. I can't rest as long as that road runner is running all over the desert and gives me absolutely no respect. Because to Wile E. Coyote, it's not just about catching the road runner, but he also disrespects Wile E. Coyote constantly, and that makes him fixated on the bird. I have everything. Wealth, power, the king's ear, a great family, but that one Israelite, Mordecai, is the only one who disrespects me, and so I am fixated on getting him removed from my life, and I will destroy him. Verse 14, his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, have a pole set up, reaching to the height of 50 cubits, ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the pole set up. This is a 75 to 80 foot high in your backyard. The whole town could see what you did. What a great idea. It's almost an Acme Wiley Coyote idea. I will impale Mordecai. That's what it was. It wasn't really a gallows. A lot of people thought it was a gallows, but it wasn't. The Persians, a lot of people don't realize, invented crucifixion. They would really disgrace people by doing this, and the Greeks didn't adopt the Greeks didn't adopt this, but of course we know the Romans did, because Jesus hung on the cross, Peter hung, later hung on the cross as well as many of the apostles. Eighty feet high, where everyone can see it. Haman is wants to show everybody this guy, he disrespects me. So Haman's plan will continue next week in part two of the sovereignty series inside the mind of a wily e. coyote part two and there are two things we can take of this if we cl as we close today number one if we are working out of god's plan in our lives and in that intend to harm someone who is we need to realize that god works sovereignly over our circumstances even Christians can get worldly in our thinking at times, and we need to keep those feelings in check and in prayer. Number two, maybe there has been a Haman in your past, or even one in the present working against you in your life. There will always be jealous people in our lives, especially when they see God sovereignly moving to bless you in tough circumstances. When these wily coyotes raise up to devour us, then it's our duty as believers to be like Mordecai. Pray and fast. Allow God to work sovereignly in the plan. We are God's people and he desires to move in our lives. And if we surrender in prayer and sacrifice, then he can have a hand in our situations working behind the scenes preparing what was meant for evil against you to be turned for good towards you because he is an awesome God. That's all, folks. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that whenever wily coyotes come against us, that, Father, we can escape like the roadrunner. That, Lord, you allow us to slip through that you sovereignly will take care of us. And Lord, I pray your sovereignty over those who are listening today. I ask, Lord, that you would sovereignly move in their lives and you would help them, Lord, with whatever they might be going through. Father, I thank you. I praise you for who you are, that you are a mighty and awesome God. Thank you, Father, for protecting us, for watching over us, and for keeping us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the JTP, the Juniper Tree Podcast. If you did, please like and subscribe. 
thank you and may God bring whole healing through his holiness.